You are listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Thank you for downloading and subscribing. Coming to you virtually live from high atop the historic Raleigh building in beautiful downtown Raleigh. The NCF&B takes the listener behind the scenes to tell the stories of the people that contribute to the creation of the food and beverage community of North Carolina. And now, the misfits in the dish pit, the faces of the front. They are Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello and welcome to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your host today, Matthew Weiss. My co-host, one Max Trujillo, is out on special assignment. He couldn't be here today, but we could not pass up the opportunity to meet with one of the featured hallmark producers of Barolo, of the Piedmont region. Here today in studio is Francesca Vira. Thank you, Matt. So nice to meet you and thank you all. So glad to be here. It's awesome to have you. And thank you for coming to North Carolina. Thank you for thinking of us as uh, important enough to be here and spend time. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, actually you're coming from one Piemonte to another Piedmont. Yeah, that's something I noticed years ago, one of my very first trips, and I was so impressed by that. And somehow I start to feel, okay, now I realize why I feel so much home anytime I come to North Carolina, the weather, the landscape, the people. Yeah. So um, always feel so blessed to be here and uh, to be back. Oh, my goodness. Such a joy every single time. Yeah. So I want to talk about that because people love you here. But before we talk about how much we love you, let's talk about your family and your winery. And some people who are listening, maybe they don't even know what Vira is or how it started. So uh, you are, like I said, a producer of great wine out of the Piemonte region of Italy, uh, well known for your Cru Barolo. Um, you make a lot of wine, though. You make some Dolcetto. You make some Riesling, which we're going to talk about, and a bunch of other, um, some some Barbera and some other great wines. So just give us a little background on how Vira came to be what it is today. Well, um, long story short, it's impossible to say that. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long story long. <laughs> it's going to be a long story long, but uh, I will do my best to keep it as much short as possible. Well, first of all, Piedmont or better, Piemonte in Italy, we're talking about a region which is the northwest side of Italy. We are completely surrounded by the Alps, and this is definitely shaping the landscape and shaping the microclimate, but as well, it shaped the story of Vira. Um, our family is living in the highest part of the village of Barolo, and when I say a village, I'm really talking of a little bit more than 700 people, mm-hmm. not any K after 700. Well, um, the family is there since the 1600s. Those are the oldest uh, documents we are able to find. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, we wanted actually to know why, which was actually the true spelling of our surname. Yeah, this is, I'm glad you're bringing this up. Okay. <laughs> we couldn't actually end up with a unique answer because the oldest documents are carrying the J, but then through the centuries, the J was turning to an E, but there are also family carrying the Y. Uh, we, you might perceive those uh, being very different letters, but when we are talking about uh, Italian alphabet, the J is considered to be a long I, the Y okay. is considered to be a Greek I, so somehow they might be just slightly different spelling or misspelling of the surname itself. Yeah, and back in the 1600s, you have very small pockets and lots of different dialects, even from town to town. So Yeah, and it was not so much education. We definitely have to think about that, you know. Uh, very few were the people educated, and um, and that's something to keep in consideration. Well, what is um, what happened in our family is that uh, our grandparents were the very first people who were able uh, to live leave the countryside and move to the bigger town of Torino. Uh, Torino is the major town of Piemonte, is where the Winter Olympic Games took place in uh, 06. And, uh, and well, when you were the very first family to do such a step back in time, you had the duty to help uh, your kids and, and above all your friends and the kids of your friends to find a new, new job, a new house in the big city. So when my father, who is one of five kids, say to his parents that he wanted to be a winemaker. So he wanted to leave the town of Torino, go back to the town of Alba, and the word Alba will come back when we're going to talk about wines later yeah. on. Uh, so better, actually, Alba is a major town of our neighborhood. Well, in Alba, there is the winemaking high school. Our grandparents' answer was simply no. 
back in the 60s, being a winemaker meant you were a farmer, and farmer were, you know, uh, basically people were not able to, to do anything good with their life. Mm-hmm. So um, our dad was forced to study in the town of Torino. His high school turned to be the most political politically active high school in 1968. We still don't know which role our father had. He always told my brothers and I was uh, acting against the revolutionary people okay. with the idea that uh, um, they were being raised as a generation with no education. But, you know, anytime we drop this question into conversation of the family, like a big, big black... Uh, he was walking hello. two sides of the fence. <laughs> oh, we, Very diplomatic. He is very diplomatic, yeah. no doubt, and we love him, but he's also a very smart person, so I can definitely imagine him really thinking and taking care of his own uh, education. But, well, because his father was working for the army, he thought it was not a good idea to have any kids in trouble, and apparently they took our dad and sent him to spend the entire summertime in the countryside. Yeah. Purpose was super easy to understand. Uh, very first family purpose, take one of your kids, educate one, and that's going to help to educate all the other four. Second purpose was a show was about showing Aldo to our dad that being a farmer was actually a very serious job and very hard job. And doing it in a place where there is basically no social life was going to be, you know, actually the the most secure things for our grandparents to change our dad's mind about being a farmer. Yeah, because he's like 18 or 19 at the time. He's a little bit of a rebel rouser, it sounds, and probably like a handsome, suave, well-educated. And then you take him out of the big city and put him on the farm. Everything, but his age was even lower. He was 15 years old. Okay, yeah. A little more um, brash and brazen even. So, And plus, uh, uh, whenever you think of Piedmont, think about a very hilly area. You know, when you move from one place to the other, if it's going to be downhill, super easy. When you have to go back, it's slightly harder. Plus, uh, your dry license, you can get it only at age of 18. So this means uh, bicycle. No means of transportation. Or, exactly. Yeah, and no public transportation plus. So our grandparents were absolutely sure about the result. What he could not expect was that at the end of the summer, our father went back to them and say, well, I do understood this is the job is meant for me that point, they could not step back. At the same time, uh, they moved to the bigger town of Torino, but they kept the family house, and they had another family farming everything for them. We had the system called the sharecropper system. At the end of that year, the old sharecropper decided to retire. None of his kids wanted to continue. To, to continue. And, um, and, well, our grandparents also have to figure out who's going to be in charge of everything, who's going to be decide the job, the things you have to do in the fields, uh, hiring the people, controlling the job is done properly. And our father happened to be the right guy at the right place uh, at the right time. It just all came together, yeah. If not for, it was completely under legal age. <laughs> to run. So this is going to tell you why our company was not named after him directly. So it's not called Aldo Vaira, as the most part of the winery in our region found it in back in time, but has this GD Vaira, mm-hmm. and nobody really knows what does GD means, but simply are the capital letters of the two names of my grandpa, Giuseppe Domenico Vaira, our mm-hmm. senior, spelled with a J, the old fashioned, and, uh, and it is officially was our grandpa. The real guy was this 15 city guy uh, wearing blue jeans, uh, very different from everybody else, uh, and uh, with this huge desire to do something amazing uh, with farming. Wow. And so is that why on the bottle you will see Vira spelled V-A-J-R-A as opposed to V-A-I-R-A? So that was well. actually, that's another oh, that's whole a whole topic. Other story. I mean, okay. uh, we should probably do yeah, another yeah, podcast. Yeah, uh, we're going to have to do all that. the history and everything. But so, yeah, let's, let's start talking about wine and let's start talking about how your family then started making the wine. Um, but I want to start off with a quote that um, I think Giuseppe said to your father at some point that I think gives a great perspective on to what your winemaking style and philosophy is like. And so then you can... Um, add to that. So uh, I guess at some point your dad was struggling in your grand, uh, with the decision of, of making wine and, and making this his life. And your grandfather, correct me if I'm wrong, said to him, what would life be like without beauty? You don't need it to live, but life is not the same without it. Wine is like this. Yeah, that was actually the discussion that happened in between my older brother, Giuseppe, mm. who was uh, another very smart person, and my dad, who was a very not- another 
two very smart people. But our dad's uh, reaction when Giuseppe, my brother, asked him, what is the social purpose of our job? That was the question. Uh. So um, our dad's reaction was, he always told us, that it, he was going to answer as his father was going to answer to him. Like in a very rough way, if you have a roof above your head, that's a social purpose. And then he started to look around himself. And uh, we are very lucky. We we met amazing people during our life, uh, amazing artists. Our parents, they always love art, but those people, they really help to... Um, you know, to to see things from different perspective, to go deeper into into the true values of life. Those are people like Gianni Gallo, the author of the most part of our labels, as well as Father Costantino Ruggeri, who is the guy who designed the stained glass windows at the winery. Okay. As well as the label of Barolo Albe and the label of the Fresa Chie. Well, that look behind my brother's shoulder and saw so another painting of another friend's of family and and looking at that painting, the answer he gave to Giuseppe is like, you know, way deeper, was about uh, talking about the beauty, about the creation as well. You know, we are farmers, and uh, it's enough, you know, 10 minutes of hailstorm to remember you that you are not an artist mm, at all. Yeah. And that the land is just so, would you say, low, you know. But because it's such a hard job, you definitely have to fill your heart with beauty and with bigger thought. So during harder time, you can go through. Yeah. Does the uh, do you, does the family now live back in in the village of Vernier, or you still have the family in Torino? So the most part of the family is still in Torino. Okay. And uh, all the um, all the brothers and uh, families of them uh, of my father are still in the town of Torino. We are the only one in Barolo. Okay. Cool. So now let's uh, switch and talk about the wines and the first vintage. And the first thing, though, before we get into it, I just want to let you know and let our listeners know that if they would like to find Vira wines in the local area or even in Southern Pines, a great friend of our show carries them, and that is the Triangle Wine Company. You can find them in four areas all the way out in Southern Pines. You can get them in Morrisville or in Cary or in my backyard, Holly Springs. Use the NCFB promo code. They'll give you 10% off. Sometimes they might even give you more if you uh, if they listen to us and they like us, and they do. And also, you can order online. So go to trianglewineco.com for all of your Vira wines and needs. All right. So let's talk about these wines. So the first vintage that your father made was 1972. Uh, and that seemed like a very rough vintage. But um, I'm curious as to... At that time, what was going on for Piemonte producers, for Barolo? And just to give our listeners who might not be, you know, the most wine savvy or just getting into understanding uh, th- this, this area where, where, you, where you live and make wine from is hallowed ground for making the best Nebbiolo in the world. And I don't think that's arguable. Um, and then, but you have this, uh, this, this history of farmers um, and What's interesting also is a very the, the area of Piemonte is very French influenced back back into medieval times in the 1600s when your family was there, um, so you have that influence in the winemaking, um, but then you have this huge controversy of how Nebbiolo should be made and then how once it starts to become a profitable business and commercialized how how others are going to perceive this wine, so I I know that's a lot to grasp in one sentence, but. Jump in there about your family's philosophy of making Barolo and then and and how it came to be what it is today. Well, I would say that uh, when our father started to make wine, um, we he started keeping in our family one generation of winemaking. His grandfather, Carlin, was considered to be one of the cool guys making wines in our neighborhood. Okay. And um, This is his grandfather on a, his paternal? Will be my great-grandfather. On, 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 on the my other dad's side? side of, okay. On my dad's side. On your dad's so, side. So, Carlin Vaira uh, used to be this uh, cool guy uh, walking the cellar, constantly with two glasses. And the funny thing is that uh, our father, being a kid, he remember his grandpa sipping the wine and uh, tasting. And at one point when he was saying like, a specific word, that was the time to rock the vat. And, uh, and the grandmother was uh, getting to the cellar, yelling against him, and keep saying, Carlin, if you keep sipping the wine, by the time the wine is going to be good, we won't have enough wine for all the year round. So <laughs> that was, those were the memories <clears throat> he had about winemaking within his family. 
But in real life, everything he learned at, was at university. Okay. So his approach was very scientific since day zero. And yet, uh, born in a time where Barolo were bone dry white wine, but, sorry, bone dry red wine, in, um, with, with a lot of structure. It was more about uh, my brothers and I having the desire to dig into the story of Nebbiolo and realizing actually what, which is the social value of a glass of Barolo, which is incredible. Very few people know that Barolo wine were only created in 1830. Okay. And the major purpose of those wine was, um, there were two, there were two players. One was Camillo Ben Soconti Cavour, who wanted to make a wine that could stand as champagne were standing uh, in Europe, bank in time. So whenever the ambassador were going around Europe, they were bringing a bottle of champagne. And there was a way so that the other country, when they were meeting those other kings, they were saying, oh, look, the French people have been here. And so he wanted to make something cool as that. But at the same time... But he was had, making sparkling wine or he was making... Oh, well, at the same time... I know that there, there is also a great history of making champ method champagne wine. Absolutely. But uh, at the same time, in the village of Brolo, the last nobleman got married with uh, Juliette Colbert, and her idea was to maximize the revenue of the land, so to support all the social operas were built and done in the town of Torino, back in time, helping orphans and helping women have been into jail to be reintegrated into the society. And very few people know this page of history. So both those people, they ask for a commercial wine was based in Genova, Monsieur Udo, to help them understand which was the best way. And before Monsieur Udo, somebody else came and somebody else suggested to pull out all the vines and plant more Pinot Noir and make sparkling out of that. Actually, it was Juliette Colbert to say, no, wait a second, we do have to maximize what we do have here. And what we had here was Nebbiolo. Yeah. But uh, how people are drinking their Nebbiolo, we don't know. At least it took us definitely a while, and it's enchanting another enchanting page of history. So, well, what which were the um, the innovation that Juliette Colbert brought was about uh, doing fermentation in cellars, mm -hmm. which means that back in time probably people were keeping their cask outside the cellar. Ah, you can't and control then, temperature then. And that yeah, is, yeah. but uh, then was about uh, keep aging the wine in our cask until the tannins were getting softer. Years ago, I was talking with Giuseppe, my older brother, and we realized we had the same experience. Our very first school trip was from the elementary school in Barolo into the castle of Barolo, like 10 minutes walk. And the teacher told us that people before Barolo was creating were drinking something not good, um, something fizzy, uh, terrible. Years later, when you grew up and you know that all the human being is all about looking for the best, you start to wonder, okay, maybe it was just different, was just so different from what we are used now. So we start to talk with people, friend of us, and we need actually a friend of us based in Sacramento, California, who is Daryl Corti, somebody who knows wine incredibly well and was one of the very first people that our father met back in the 70s, was one of those people who were going to Caluso, sorting Herbalucha and bringing Herbalucha to California. Mm -hmm. When nobody knew anything about Herbalucha. Yeah. That's Still to tell you. Still nobody knows really anything about Herbalucha, but <laughs> that's, that's to tell about podcast, that guy. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, Daryl told us, wait, have you ever heard and have you ever read the diaries of Thomas Jefferson? And we felt so ignorant in that moment. We say, well, we barely knew the story of Italy, so why we should know about Thomas Jefferson and his diaries? So because of him, we found those diaries. And we realized that Thomas Jefferson actually came to Piemonte in 1787. So, well before time, Barolo was created. And the, he didn't come for the wine, he came for the rice. He came for the rice? We do make rice in Piemonte. Okay. Uh, very high quality rice. He was farming golden. Yeah. Golden Carolina. So, imagine like a spoon of golden Carolina in your mouth. In Italian, to Italian people, we say it's like eating a spoon of fregola sarda, you know, rough, basically. And imagine a very nice spoon of risotto, like a carnaroli, super soft, super round, creamy. Well, he wanted to know what people were doing with their rice, how they could make to have those pieces of rice perfectly round and so, so... Perfect. So he came to Piemonte, and on the way to go to Vercelli, where we do produce rice in Piemonte, he stopped by in the town of Torino. Okay. And he drank this wine made out of Nebbiola grape, Nebbiolo, mm -hmm. and described the wine being brisk as a wine of champagne, dry as a claret of Bordeaux, and pleasant as the sweet Madeira. 
And when we read this quote, we look at each other and say, okay, this is, will be like a chimera, like this weird animal, almost like a monster. Because I guess each of us is thinking right now, you know, creating a huge cocktail and a bit of um, Madeira and then, uh, um, I don't know, two ounces of uh, Claret from Bordeaux and then just top everything with a nice uh, glass of uh, champagne. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any of us is going to enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we start to break down the sentence. We found that the Barolo in the 40s were described to be marsalati, so tasting like marsala. Marsala Madeira is the same winemaking style. Yeah. Uh, we do understand Claret because Claret were, was the word that the English people gave to the lighter style Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. One of the old nicknames of Nebbiolo is Chiaretto, ah, okay. light in color. Yeah. And if you think a glass of Barolo, I'm sure all of us, none of us is expecting a lot of color yeah. in a glass of Barolo, but we could not understand champagne. So we start to make a sparkling in Nebbiolo, end up being too bone dry. So our current sparkling is called Nostra Signora della Neve. It's 50 Nebbiolo and 50 Pinot Noir and spend uh, over five years on the lease. It's absolutely incredible. So for the holiday time, you know, nice uh, tar, beautiful brightness, good structure. And uh, that was not what Thomas Jefferson had. So it should be something else. We found other winemaking notes going back to 1606. And what we found is that actually people were realized that uh, keeping a little bit of CO2 from the fermentation was a cool way to focus the attention on the top of your tongue, on what was tingling up there, and not so much about the tannins in the back. Ah. And now we also understand why one of the improvements that Corbert did was to take the cask from outside, inside. So we can see that as an improvement into winemaking, but once we read those winemaking notes from 1606, we knew that they know exactly what they were doing. The products are completely different, and if you can happen to have the chance to put a, your hands of a bottle of Claret JC, that's going to be the opportunity for you to know how an old Barolo was tasting. Ah, like. now it explains who JC is and everything. Okay, cool. So now let's get to modern day. So you guys have this wealth of history, but then your dad is also, um, is, is, is a, is a trained, you know, a officially trained winemaker. Um, and then, you know, you have the history of the Conterno brothers and fighting of, uh, you know, whether using barrique or is large, is small barrique or large Sylvonian oak or whatever. Uh, where do you guys fall on that whole conversation, um, of how to produce your Barolo and Nebbiolo? Well, I guess when you grow up being the city guy and perceive uh, after a couple of years because you finish your, your university and you be you have been a teacher, being called the professor, you start to realize that you are doing your own way. And somehow, even if you're never that comfortable to be by yourself, um, when you have ideas, when you have a goal, you will keep going your own way. So very few people actually know that uh, our dad was the very first guy who brought in barriques in 1971, way before the old movement, uh, modern before it style. Became fashionable. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that always told us about this uh, phone call that happened in between uh, Luigi Veronelli, which was a very cool um, journalist back in time. He was actually more than a journalist. He was a sociologist. Um, and we, we have to thank him for the burn of the single vineyards Brollo, indeed. But, uh, well... Uh, Luigi Veronelli one day, call, one day called Aldo Vaira and he asked him, so what do you, I heard you're using those uh, bricks. I want to know, what do you think about them? And our dad was uh, farming already back in time on the top of Brico delle Viole and he was making a Brico delle Viole Barolo. And so just for those of you listening, so Brico delle Viole is there, uh, your top crew? Would you say? I mean, one of your top crews. So Definitely physically is the top crew. It's the highest crew in the village of crew, Barolo yeah, so. and it's the vineyard that draws the style of our company. Yeah. And when, so when we say crew and we're talking about regards to Barolo, we're talking about hills, specific vineyard, hill, hilly vineyards that are the top that grow the best fruit. And then you bottle and then you bottle them and put that on the label so people know where the grapes came from. Well, and uh, Brico delle Viole, because of his uh, elevation, because the beautiful drop of temperature in between day and night, and because the soil type always gave us extremely elegant, complex, but at the same time, very delicate wine. And uh, so using the brick on those wine really proved that uh, those containers were extremely interesting, but they were not meant for what uh, we're working. Right. You know, and so our, that was the answer that 
gave uh, to Gina Veranelli was, you know, very incredible, but this is not what we're looking for. So to answer your question, the point was that uh, our father never felt that he had to join one group or the other, mm-hmm. but to him was always more about understanding what he was farming mm-hmm. and where he wanted to go. Yeah. At the same time, he always, um, in the beginning of his life, he wanted to make a wine that could astonish people and then start to realize that what was making him happy was to make wines where people, they were making people happy. And when you have a bottle on the table who's going to be the rock star, that's going to take the attention. It's not a, there's no time anymore to talk about your life. It's not any more time to enjoy about the food. But so he, did, he realized that the kind of wine he wanted to make where wines were complex, catch your attention, basically when you finish the bottle, realizing how much you enjoy those wine. Yeah. But wines are a facilitator of the time around the table. Yeah. That's maybe because we are family and and uh, we are an Italian family and everything goes around the table. You know, table is the time, the place where you catch with your friends, where you talk with the family, uh, where you share ideas, when you share your desire. And uh, to us, uh, that's such a precious time. But I was also thinking, in modern times, how special this is. We are running so crazy. And uh, to have time to talk uh, each other is the most precious thing. So we just want our wine to help people to enjoy this time even more. Yeah, help communicate. Uh, let's just clarify a couple of things that we talked about for people that might not understand, oh, barrique and what and why that affects the wine. And, and uh, so on a very basic level, when you're using small barrique uh, and new wood, that is giving more surface area or less surface area to the wine and having more of an influence of wood on your wine, especially when it's new, it's going to give flavors of oak and vanilla and baking spice, etc. When you have bigger oak, it's less impactful on the wine because there's, uh, there's more surface area for the wine to breathe and for the, also for the, for the, for the barrel to breathe. Um, on top of that, there's obviously the use of new oak versus old oak. When it's old oak, it has less influence, again, on the wine, less imparting of flavors, and also it's more of an aging vessel. Uh, just trying to get our listeners to understand about the differences and in, in the philosophies. And um, But what I love about what you're saying is it, it's not about being dogmatic about choosing one or the other. Oh, we're a winery that only uses small barrique or we only use big cask. You're saying that what you guys do is – it depends on the fruit and the wine that that what what that wine needs to become the most complex and dynamic wine possible. Exactly. We only have one rule at Vaira. Look what is in front of you. Mm-hmm. And it sounds easy, but it's one of the hardest things to, to be done. Because uh, especially when you're a winemaker, you start to create your own ideas and you start to create your own recipes, really like, uh, you know, cooking. But the point is that you need to be so attentive to understand that a uh, your tomatoes, which in our case are our grapes, are always different. Yeah. And so the way you're going to work has to change. So I guess that uh, we are probably more like patisserie, patissier, mm-hmm. in the way that you are so attentive to the little details because that is what helps you to release uh, the best. In our, in our case, our desire is to really let the varieties in the soil doing the speech into the wine. Okay. Especially when you think of Barolo area, which is a super tiny area, you can really see from one side to the other. It's, uh, I hope not to get wrong with the distances, but it's something like uh, three by five miles as a crow flies. Yeah. That is, if we're not able to let that uniqueness to talk into the wine, we have the feeling we are losing everything. So our winemaking style was, uh, and still is, uh, fermentation in stainless steel as a way to help us to be extremely precise with the aromatics. And then we do age uh, large cask neutral oak for the, for the aging. The oak is extremely important because Nebbiolo is super tannic variety. And so only the time in the oak is actually helping to create like longer chain of polyphenols. So we actually can perceive smoother tannin. Yeah. It's also a question of a lot of attention about picking time, completed the stem, and so many little attention. So going back to your question, modern versus wine mi- versus traditional, we were perceived to be the most modern among the traditional and the most uh, traditional among the modernists. <laughs> because uh, stainless steel was perceived to be modern, <coughs> as uh, large casts were perceived to be traditional. But the point is uh, to us, uh, once again, let the, let the, let the nature do, do the, the work. Yeah. Uh, Really quick, and then we're going to move on to why you grow wheat, Riesling, and um, actually the, your 
you're, uh, reminded me when you were talking about distances about the story of the Albi Barolo. Uh, but do, do you think that I feel like mostly in the Barolo community now, not just yourself, but all producers are going for that. It's it's really about what the vineyards are, and nobody is. Re- I mean, I'm sure there's a couple of producers, but really nobody's dogmatic these days about just no, we do it this way, and that's it. Would you agree with that? That that's the general course of of the Piemonte region now. If you look around ourselves, um, it's actually the story of winemaking. Winemaking is affected yeah. by fashion. Uh, now the the fashion is not anymore about talking about or orga- about uh, modern versus traditional, because we reach extreme which are incredible, like three hundred percent new oak. I remember going back yeah. home and asked Dada. I love math, but I, I don't know how to calculate three hundred percent. What does that mean? <laughs> right. And so, um, the point is that which is now, ridiculous. It, essentially, it means that you're taking wine that's been aged in a brand new oak barrel, putting it in another new oak barrel, and then doing it again for however many times, and it's a little bit absurd. Yeah. So now the big topic is about uh, organic versus biodynamic and natural wine. So those things are not done yet. We just uh, we're just switching the topic into other interesting conversation and uh, and this is also very interesting for us because uh, another cool thing that our father did he got the very first uh, certification being a, a farmer a organic farmer back in 1971 people were not even used the word organic yeah I can't even imagine what that so was the third one given in Piemonte uh, the very first one given to a wine grower uh, was the one so I'm saying so because to us once again in this modern topic, it's not a question of being on one side or the other of the fight. But when you're a farmer, you do understand you belong to the nature. The very last things you want to do is to poison the nature. But uh, even more than that, to us human beings are the most important thing. Yeah. So the way of farming is because we do respect people first. Nice. Okay. Tell us the great story of the Barolo Albi and the Three Peaks Albe, despite the modern label, which was uh, was made by Father Costantino, uh, is the oldest way of making Barolo. Uh, I told you about uh, Luigi Veronelli being the guy who uh, who pushed a lot to, to work on single vineyards. What he realized in the 80s is that uh, being a farmer was still, you know, the worst things you can do, uh, the worst job you can do in your life. But whenever he was looking to France and Burgundy, especially, the wine growers were the most important people. Yeah. And so he started to wonder why is this is possible. And so you start to realize that uh, people, if you were farming specific piece of land, you were getting, you know, value of your job and recognition just because we, you were farming that specific crew, you know, using the word you just explained. But well, the point, uh, because of that, he was the one that started to push people to work uh, on single vineyards. And this is why nowadays we don't drink Barolos, generally speaking. We do drink Bricco delle Viole, we do drink Ravera, we do drink uh, uh, Baudana, we do drink Ceretta, uh, we do drink Costa di Rose, you know, very specific. But what is the value of single vineyards is uh, truly when you are able to work with extremely old vine. Vines are talking about the place where they do come from, which was the other way to making wine blending together the vineyards. If we talk about the very cool winemakers from the 80s, those people were making the red label, the white label, the black label. Behind the color of the label were the different blend. They were proving to be good winemakers when they knew where to sort their fruit and how to put them together. Yeah. In 2000, we realized our friends, our friends at high school, um, they were asking us how a Barolo tastes like. And we start to wonder, like, well, you know, the very silly answer you will give is, like, it tastes like a Barolo. Yeah. And then you realize that it, this is not the answer. The point is uh, where our friends are going to buy their bottles of Barolo. They won't go in the cool shop you told, as just mentioned before, because in Italy you feel almost like a, a shame to ask question in a fancy wine shop. So you will go to a grocery store turning the label and trying to understand and trying to make the best decision. And back in time, the big battle of Even modern, in Italy, they're going to the grocery store to buy wine? Come on. Well, you know, back in time, especially in 2000, yet the big battle of modern versus traditional was going on. As a result, on the shelf of those uh, of the grocery store, you get uh, a lot of tenants. Mm-hmm. Tenants from the stem, tenants from the new oak. But we told, okay, we start to wonder, our friends, if we're drinking a lot of soda and maybe drinking a lot of alcohol, uh, like that's what, spirits, sh- that's what shows, yeah. They will be scared 
just scared. How we can show them the best mm -hmm. uh, f with the best value. I mean, to give them also the opportunity to drink those wine. And we realized once again, story, help us. Yeah. All the way, blending together. So we started to sort the fruit around uh, the village of Barolo and above all around the Bricco delle Viole. If you, the word Bricco delle Viole means the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. Paint yourself on this beautiful hill. You have the slope at your feet. You look in front of you, you do have the Alps running south toward north at your right. And, um, and this is a hill. It's 3D. It's not just 2D. So at your left side, upper left side, you have a Fossati. At your feet, the lower part of south, you have La Volta. Upper south, uh, west, uh, you do have Coste. So we started to blend those three different vineyards, and we start to put them together. So what we do enjoy is uh, the tannins coming from the village of Brolo, very soft. But then we have those three different exposure and uh, slightly three different altitude and two older vineyards, one slightly younger. The younger one is 30 years old now, so it's not a baby. Um, and well, when you blend them together, every single vineyard, is delivering something. It's like a beautiful bouquet of flower where every single flower helps to create the harmony. Mm -hmm. In, uh, well, the price point behind Barolo Albe, that is one of the biggest commitments of our family. This is why we keep driving crappy Fiat in the, we're probably the <laughs> only one in the tiny village of Barolo right now. But uh, it's about uh, giving people the opportunity to start to drink a great Barolo. Yeah. And make them confident you know, on the structure of this beautiful wine, which we know are not easy, uh, but then make them confident so they, they can fall in love and then they can start to discover the single vineyards. Well, what I love about it uh, also, and let's let's upgrade your Fiat um, mm -hmm. to something nicer today, um, is, the, is the label on Albe is um, like a setting sun. And it, we'll post it in our show notes so that you guys can see what I'm talking about because obviously you can't see it. This is a podcast. But uh, Jeff Ramwell told me the story because he's visited you guys many times and uh, we're doing a dinner over there tonight at Mothers and Sons. But um, within something like 10 minutes... If you go to the three peaks, you can drive in your, you can get in your, drive in your car and see the sunset, or see the sunrise. Sorry, three different times exactly. within the. Is it twenty minutes? It's that you a, can a little do bit it? more than that. It's like uh, 20, 20, 30 minutes. Depends on the season, of course. Okay. Uh, yeah, because the area is extremely. You know, the three vineyards are so close one to the other, but uh, it's about really waiting the time the sun is rising. The name Albe. It's not to, to be confused with the town of Alba, so it's not Dolcetto di Alba, Barbera di Alba, but it, Alba is both the town of Alba, so the fruits are sorting around the town of Alba, but Alba is also the Italian word for sunrise. When you put it plural, you get a word albe, uh, sunrises. Three sunrises. So this is why we asked actually Jeff if he could, if he could help us on a cool project of uh, photography. And uh, the day he did, uh, he did the three sunrises in the same day and arrived at the winery, completely sweaty, say, oh, my goodness, that was tough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to carry. Yeah. You he have also to work hard. Yeah, he has to carry camera. And, exactly, yeah. which is not easy at all. But um, three different sunrises. The vines are reacting with three different photosynthesis. So it's not the Italian romantic way. It's, once again, extremely scientific. And every single vineyard delivers something else, really in terms of structure of the wine and aromatics. And blending them together, you get to have the more floral as well as the more spicy side of the Barolo production area, yet with the tannins of the village of Barolo. And this is Barolo Albe. Awesome. Okay, we're about to get out of here, so because we need to go. Actually, uh, you, a lot of people are waiting for you in this market, so uh, to to meet you or see you again, uh, as you are beloved in this area. So, I want to know what why you guys started growing Riesling there. I know you're growing some Pinot Noir and a couple of other things. Uh, also, why do we don't get any Fresa here in North Carolina? That's a whole question for uh, Jen, who's sitting next to me as well. But okay. Um... Well, we love all the different grapes of Piemonte. Mm -hmm. This is another very specific thing about Vaira, is a true love and a true commitment for biodiversity. This is why we do make two different dolcettos and two different Barbera. Ah. And the difference is not Ockis versus stainless steel, is younger versus older vines. Mm -hmm. But we also found a room for the Fresa, as well as uh, Albarossa, as well as Nascetta that goes into the white dragon, we do make it, which is under the label Luigi Baudana, which should be another yeah, story, we but that's what we're going to keep too, yeah. next time. But well, so the point is, uh, um, in 1970s, when our dad was doing the thesis at the university, there was a time people realized it was a huge lack of white wine, bone dry white wine 
in our area, in okay. Piemonte, generally speaking, but above all within the Barolo production area. If people start to do research, and all the papers were coming mainly from France, but some of them were also coming from Germany, and this is why our dads start to read about Riesling and start to drink Riesling. And a funny lot but where were they drinking Riesling from at the time? German Riesling or Alsatian Riesling? Or? There were German Riesling, some uh, weird bottle that he found in our grandfather's cellar. And he was not interested at all into those uh, bottles. So he's, he told him, OK, you can have them. Don't worry. And uh, the very first bottle was tasteless petrol. The second, again, and he started to wonder, like, OK, what's going on here? And he fell in love with Riesling because to him, it's really like Barolo. Huge complexity in the glass mm -hmm. and huge cap capability to, to evolve through the years. And uh, he always had the desire to blend one vineyard Riesling. He was forbidden to blend Riesling until 1985. As soon as the law changed, he was the very first guy to farm Rhine Riesling. So we actually have two vineyards right now. One is planted with Glonus selection coming from Geisenheim University, the most important university in Germany. And then uh, we have another vineyard, which is uh, a gift because our gift for other family of wine growers in Alsace, Marcel Dice, Frederick Mockel, mm -hmm. uh, Reckenstein and Von Bull from the Falte area. So we're talking of another 200 years of selection on the vines. I, I was extremely blessed. We took the chance uh, this year to party to the 50 harvest to, of Aldovaira. And, um, and we pull out the cork to some of those older bottles of Riesling, 92, 98, um, 2003. And, and then almost all the vintages up to 2018, which are, it's available on the market right yeah, now. We're going to taste some of it today. I'm excited. Cool. And, uh, and it's impressive. Like it, that wine can age so beautifully. And uh, I can I never have enough of that. You know, it's like keep, uh, keep discovering. Do you think that's going to be the next like uh, of the fashion for coming out of Piemonte is like, I know Riesling and then you're hearing people, the rebirth of Nachetta is that, are those the two on the cusp of like uh, yeah, commercial if we, success? If we want to talk only about Barolo, yeah, those are two. Those are the two um, uh, variety. Even if uh, uh, there are over thirty wineries are now farming uh, Riesling within Barolo production area, wow. but we do talk about mainly wineries that are based in Barolo area. They do do make Barolo, but they don't farm really Riesling within the Barolo production area. So the very first vineyard Riesling is actually Fossati. Is a crew of Barolo yeah. dedicated to, to Riesling. And that's a, that's a crazy project. It's like making Dolcetto Costa and Fossati from Premier Crew of Barolo, but all vines Dolcetto, ratio that we need like one vine to make one bottle of Dolcetto right now. It's uh, How old are incredible. those vines on, on Fossati? Uh, 40. 40 year old. Um, okay. One of the very first uh, um, research that our father did on, uh, on on varieties, he noticed that some of the vines were changing the color of the stem, started to do separate picking, separate wine making. Year after year, the red stem, Dolcetto, were giving more colors, more flavor, more structure. So we reselected those vines and regrafted within Costa and Fossati. But actually, if you we interview some of the older people of the of our area, I'm sorry that if you go on our website, you will see those people, and it's all in Italian. We are working, promising, working on uh, yeah, use subtitles your Google on that. Oh, use it exactly. But right. uh, people back in time they loved dolcetto, and it's actually one of the most modern variety you can uh, you can get also in terms of uh, food bearing. I I will say one thing. Uh, I'll comment to that. And, and again, we're running short on time, but, um, you know, Dolcetto is like the uh, redheaded stepchild, they will say. Sorry to all you redheads out there, but uh, it's not thought of very highly in the national market. But as far as like a, a wine that can give you so much pleasure in, it, in, in, in somewhat of its simplicity, but it's complex at the same time, um, I – People that know me know that I worked at Per Se for a very short time, and uh, on one of my wine quizzes there, or um, I was interviewing with the general manager there, and I said, you know, oh, what do you want to drink with truffles during truffle season? And I said, actually, I want to drink Dolcetto. He's, he lambasted me. He's like, no, this you want to drink Barbera, or Bar I mean, you want to drink Barolo, you know, or Barbaresco. He's like, the, the Dolcetto, you know, people drink as table wine there, and, you know, so it was thought of as just so... Not highly thought of, but now today you guys are helping change that perception of Dolcetto altogether. Um, real quick, so North Carolina, you come here a lot. As I said, I mean, when uh, just, uh, you know, the people that I work with, my supervisors at, at Winebo, where I work in my day job, um, actually podcasting pays the bills. It's very, very lucrative. Uh, so, you know, I just do, I just sell wine because I love it. Um, 
they uh, they they both said uh, when you were coming, they said, "Oh, I, we need to have coffee with Francesca. We need to go see her." We wh- what's uh, wh- why do you love North Carolina? Why do the people of North Carolina love you so much? Oh, you should ask those people why they like me so much because <laughs> I have no clue on that. But you know, I love them because um, they're open mind, uh, always interesting, always going deeper into the thing. This is uh, this is our family style. This is how we are. This is what I love. Uh, never staying on the surface. Always going deep in, deeper down. And then landscape is, uh, you know, this for me, it's home, mm. really. Uh, the hills. And, and I also have to say, through the years, uh, thanks to this job, I had the opportunity to meet incredible people that I can call friends. Yeah. And, uh, you know, whenever you have a friend and you're traveling, that's going to be your home. Okay, so, so thank you. So we have listeners that are all over the state, and I know you've traveled all over the state. So where have you dined that has left an impression on you in this state? Well, I guess that uh, the very first time I've been to um, Asheville, I was so impressed that being in the middle of basically nowhere, yeah. the food scene was so high mm-hmm. and the people were doing uh, so much research on their food and supporting uh, so much of the local production. That was, uh, I guess, already six or seven years ago. It was probably at the beginning of the trend of you know trying to sort as much as possible close to where you are and uh, and that was like uh, you know like one of those momentum where your mind your eyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and and then all the triangle area oh my goodness there is so much research here and it's it's amazing but uh, I got the opportunity to visit the coast and uh, I mean so beautiful and all over it's also true that I'm meeting people that are into wine right and people that are into wine there are people that are very cultural. They love to to constantly discover something new, and this is making uh, just more easy for me to meet interesting people and interesting cuisine. So you so, love it all. You're very diplomatic. Thank you, though. Thank you for coming I here. Mean, it's um, a beautiful country. Uh, come on. <laughs> and and we're going to give you something to go home with and take for the end of your day, even though you're going to have some uh, wonderful food today. So uh, thankfully, you're going to go home with some proof alcohol ice cream. Um, and so what it is is it's alcohol into your ice cream, but it's actually an amazing texture. And just for ice cream, it tastes awesome. It's a nice little kick. It's about 7% alcohol, but it's a way to think differently about dessert. And I'm going to give you my personal favorite. I'm just going to make the, the, the choice for you. It's moonshine cheesecake. So it's delicious. I'm and uh, very happy to try it. Yeah. If Thank you don't you. have time to, to drink and eat, you just do it all one together with proof alcohol ice cream. Francesca, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Everybody out there, go get yourself some Viro wines and you will drink very merrily. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the NC f and Podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged.